I don't know what's going to happen. But the thing is, the thing we fear, if the present administration is going to cut taxes by 10%, they've got to get money from somewhere. They've got to get money from somewhere. Now, do you know in Washington that the Dairy Support Program is considered in the same breath as welfare programs? The Dairy Support Program is considered by Congress and the legislators as a welfare program. There's 3% of the population that are farmers. There's a heck of a lot more than that on welfare. So if they consider it a welfare program, I think we're going to go to the top of the welfare list and be the first one cut. I think we're going to be faced with two alternatives. They talked about these in the, this past fall. They're still on the front burner. To be in a new farm bill. And whether you realize it or not, there's only two commodities today that are on a parity index, as milk and tobacco. Everything else has gone off. And they've gotten stung when they went off. And I go to Washington, and they talk cost of production, and I smile because that's our language. Then they tell me the cost of production is $11.30. And I said, forget it. Let's go back to parity because we know it's not true. And that's why the dairy farmer is making so much money. So we're going to have one or two alternatives, in my opinion. We're going to have a, what they call a trigger mechanism, which will adjust parity based upon what they call net removals. How much butter, cheese, dry milk the government buys of the total production. Go up and down based upon that. The other alternative is to have a separate dairy parity. This one probably has a pretty good chance, too. And the present parity law, feed costs are weighted 11.5%. The economists tell me today that feed costs constitute 44% of producing milk. So a dairy parity would be related directly to the items that affect producing milk. They would not take into effect general inflation, the consumer price index, what the rest of the country is doing, only affect what affects dairy farmers. So we could be like yo-yos. Grain is king, I grant you that, in agriculture because all of our animals eat it. You've got to have grain to put fat on cattle. You've got to have grain to make milk. You can feed them all the beet pulp and hay and everything you want that fills up the bellies, but it doesn't produce the milk. You've got to have the grain. So if grain price is going up, then a dairy parity, the price will go up. But when they go down, Katie bar the door, because there she goes with 44% weight. And that's what we're headed for. CNI, Consumer Nutrition Institute, Ms. Ellen Haas, director, has a reconstituted milk proposition. She's been trying to get the department to look at for well over a year now. Again, we've opposed it. In written statements, we'll continue to oppose it. The Department of Agriculture just last week came out with an impact statement on what effect it would have on the economy, which they have to do now under the present administration. Everything's got to have an economic impact statement. So they came out with an economic impact statement on reconstituted milk. What they arrived at is it would save the consumer $165 million a year. Of course, the consumers jump with joy. It'll save the government $185 million. 
because we take good wholesome milk, we run it through a dryer, we put it in a bag, we take it into a dairy plant and add the water back in and package it and sell it to the consumer. So it'll save the government $185 million because the dairy plants will be buying the powder. It'll, it'll cost the dairy farmer $525 million. And you add the two figures together, I don't get 525. So somewhere, I guess it's the normal government take or something in there, that they take administration fees off of it or something. I don't know what happened to the rest of it, but the savings don't equal the loss. But uh, so we'll be watching that one. We'll be watching it very carefully because I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of it. Because one thing that I firmly believe that has reduced the consumption of dairy products is what I like to terminize as bastardizing the products. Try to buy a good half gallon of ice cream today. You can't hardly find one because they've made it sweet and cold and that's about all you can say. And you can let it melt and it doesn't even melt because it's got so much emulsifier in it. And if we start this with wholesome milk, we'll do the same thing to fluid milk as we've done to ice cream and we've done to cheese. And you tell me that's to the benefit of the consumer? Molarkey. Let me talk a little bit, and I like to brag, say this is my third convention. I wanted a challenge, so I came with this organization. I didn't realize what a challenge it was. <laughs> it's still challenging, even more so each and every year. The first year I was completely frustrated. The second year I was a little better. I'm starting on my third year and I'm not be much better than the second. But we're gaining. We had a lot of things to overcome. We had a long ways to go. But we've changed and we're gaining. We're growing. We sit back and look and say, what's the problem? What's wrong? We're not running like a bull in the china shop all the time. We analyze things. And say, what's the problem? First thing we have to do is recognize the problem. Many people go around and smile all the time. They're happy because they're too stupid to recognize they got a problem. So we got to recognize when we got a problem, what the problem is, and then what the solution is. And that's the process we follow now. That's what we've done. And we don't always come up with the answers, but we try. I think we come up with a lot of them. But as of October 1st, I've realigned the dairy department. I said I've been with the organization not quite three years, and I've realigned it three times. Uh, so I hope it doesn't continue. We, one of these days we might get it right. But we want to be flexible. So we got four areas in dairy in the United States today. You can see them on our bulletin board out there, our booth. Uh, Steve Pavich is area director of the Midwest area. Gene Paul is area director of the upper Midwest area. Walt Albers now has what we call the Mid-Atlantic area, which is Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky. Dick Emerson is area director of the Northeast, which is New York, New Jersey, and New England. So we've broken down that area into a separate area now. The area directors report directly to me. That's my staff. Al Scott was made assistant director of operations with full authority to make decisions because I don't give out blind titles like banks who give out titles of vice presidents or cashiers or assistant vice presidents to everybody. When I call somebody an assistant, he's truly an assistant with all the responsibilities that go with it. And Al has that. And I have to do a lot of traveling 
We all do. But either Al or I are available. And when I'm not there, Al can make the decisions. And half the time when I'm there, he makes them. So we do have people who are in charge. My home office staff, you see most of them. All, there's two of them. Only got three. Well, there's the third one. My whole home office staff is here now. I've got three people now. And that's all I want. And I defy you to show any other national organization that's running a dairy program with three staff members and a director of operations and a department director. But that's our overhead. But it's all I need. Because the responsibility is in the areas. It's with the area directors. Because we tried to market milk out of corny. And the damn stuff soured before we could move it. So if the area directors don't know what to do with it, don't call me. Because I don't know what to do with it. I can buy all I can drink. So it's placed in the areas. We do not market milk out of corny. And we're not going to. It's going to be in the areas. We give them guidance. I talk with my area directors on a daily basis. We give them guidance from the home office. We give them assistance and quality control and procurement and training. So we have the strings that we can pull to keep control but they operate it under our direction. But we don't make all the decisions. They make them. Most of the time, they'll check with us. They know they're right before they call us in most instances. So they just want some support. So our only job is to question. Did you think of this? Did you think of that? Did you think of this? Yeah, I did that. Yeah, fine. Then what are you calling me for? Go ahead and do it. So that's the way we operate today. Now, we're upgrading our staff and increasing it. But we're upgrading and increasing as we grow, not before we grow. And as Ed pointed out, we've grown 20% in the last year. We've increased our staff because as we grow, I can afford to put more staff on your payroll than I can when you've got a smaller volume. So with me, I can handle the volume. Your staff can handle the volume we've got today. As we put volume on, then we put staff on. We don't put staff on in hopes of putting volume on because we go broke that way. And I'll tell you, this dairy department is not going to go broke. And if you go to the financial meetings, you'll find out that we made money last year and we're going to break black figures, and that's our policy, and we'll continue to do it because we're going to run it in a business-like manner. But I'm proud of this staff, and I'm proud of this organization. Each day, more and more so. Still challenging. We still keep going because there's a new challenge every day around the corner. One thing we... Ed mentioned that we're going backwards. Again, we didn't hit the panic button. No sense in hitting the panic button. Because then everybody just runs in different directions. <laughs> it's like a fire alarm. So you don't accomplish anything that way. So we sit back and say, what's the problem? And we meet with our regionals and our area directors. And we come up with one major thing. We're not training our people. We hire somebody. We float him around the office for a week. And we say, go get him. It's like Staley said, we're just arming them with BB guns to go out and hunt elephants. So he said, by golly, if we're going to spend the money to hire somebody, 
let's train to use a rifle. And that's what we've done. And Al Scott, in addition to be, being assistant director of operations, is director of training and has done a fantastic job because I'll match your staff today up with any staff in the United States bar none today. And I wouldn't have said that three years ago, but I will today. And next year when I come back here, it's going to be better than it is today. Because we're going to grow and we're going to continue to upgrade. Now, we dropped off some areas. We've had to. We had a dairy program when I came to the organization in Idaho. Even though our president's from Idaho, they can grow potatoes. But they don't have any cows and they got no bellies. And that's two things you've got to have to run a dairy program, is cows to make the milk and bellies to put it in. They had neither. They had potatoes. And they were burying them because they couldn't afford to truck them. So we discontinued the dairy program in Idaho. We couldn't fight the battle in southwest Missouri. So we had to give it up. California, and I don't want to offend anybody from California, but I don't want California. Because it's got the ocean on one side and the mountains and the deserts on the other and no bellies in between. You can have all the milk in the state of California and you're not going to affect the price of milk throughout this United States one iota. You're going to affect it by going from Minnesota through Wisconsin and what I consider flip-flop areas and they're really not flip-flops. Oh, uh, Illinois northeast, northern part of Iowa, flip into Michigan, and it's not a flip area, it's a pretty darn sturdy program. Through Pennsylvania, New York, and New England, you've got 70% of the milk production in this United States right in that belt. And that's where you run a dairy program, and that's where we control the price of milk, and that's where we'll price milk. And we need each and every one of those areas. We've been weak in the Northeast. And I've concentrated a lot of effort in the Northeast because we have to have, in my opinion, a viable program in the Northeast to have a national dairy program. We can't ignore Pennsylvania, New York, and those areas where the milk is produced and say we got a national dairy program. There's no way we can do it. So there again, we put away the shotgun and got out the rifle and said, where do we want to go and how do we want to get there? And that's the program we're approaching today. Now, I've represented this organization for the last three years. And I wear two hats, both as a marketing man and as an attorney. And that gives me a little more fun, too, because I've got a little more versatility. Because as a marketing man, I have to answer questions. As a lawyer, I only ask questions. I don't have to answer them. So it gives me a little flexibility, a little more fun. But so I do represent this organization in all the federal order hearings throughout the United States. And I did that for 10 years prior to coming to this organization. So I'm no neophyte in that field. But uh, we do get around. I think we got a dairy program. Al's going to give me hell right now. I said, I think, and probably some staff members in here have been through my training course. I know we've got a dairy program that's going to succeed. It is succeeding, and it will work. And with that, I want to turn it over to Al Scott, who is responsible for the training of our personnel, and I'm proud of all of them. Thank you. Good morning. How many of you were on the convention floor yesterday afternoon when the, the uh, department directors gave their report? Were quite a few of you there. 
How many of you heard Ed Graff say that he'd made a bet about our SWAT team out in Vermont as to how many people they'd put on? Did you hear that? In front of all of you, he said he'd made a bet and lost, didn't he? I want you all to know he hasn't paid off yet either. <laughs> we'll get him. I do want to tell you a little bit about what's uh, gone on in the training sessions that we've held. We, we started a training program for our staff just a little over a year ago. The first uh, session was held just prior to convention last year. And I'd like to explain to you just a little bit about what goes on at these training sessions. How many of you remember back, uh, oh, 10, 12 years ago when we had a fellow come around and give us some short courses on training? I'll bet there's a lot of you here that attended them, uh, that he told us to close and to shut up. And it, Do you remember all that? You know, it works. If you've got a little practice to go along with it, it works. But, you know, we had a staff of people out here that, were very untrained. Most of them thought they knew it all. And when they'd come into these training courses, you could see on some of the old timers' faces the minute they walked in, you know, ha ha, what the hell am I doing here? I know it all already. And you know, as you'd get in through that, that training session and you'd work down towards the noon hour and long towards the evening that day, they'd start to get a puzzled look in their face. You know, by God, they didn't know it all after all. And then as that training course would go along, pretty soon about a day would go by, and all of a sudden they started to become so bewildered they didn't know where they were at. You almost lost them, didn't you? And you could see it happening in every course as we'd go through. Different people come in, and they'd get down to that low point. Now, we're never going to be able to get this thing. And then along towards about the last day, they'd start putting it all together, and, you know, they got to be pretty good. And as we continued with those training programs, they got better and they got better. Do you know, we, we didn't really know it before, but do you know we've been selling this program, this, this whole organization on a negative basis for years? Instead of talking about all the good things, we were always talking about the bad ones. And we've sold that through the years. And it's very hard to change. But instead of telling of the benefits of the new National Farmers Organization, we were always, always selling doom and gloom. Now we've changed our staff around. I guess the next step is to get the members changed around a little bit too. So if they go out and start talking on a positive basis and they're proud. You know, our staff was not too much different than members out there. When they'd go down the road and uh, knock on a door, they'd get to Joe and Joe would raise one objection. And boy, the easiest thing to do was change the subject, turn around and run if you get away from there fast enough, or you get in an argument with him. Or we'd start running the group down that he was presently selling his milk to. We'd do one of those three things. And you know, pretty soon we had an enemy out there instead of a, a prospect. Because he didn't like to have his organization run down. He was, he was proud of it. He'd been selling milk to him for years and his daddy before him. And boy, don't anybody run down to milk haulers because we've all got the best milk hauler in the country. So, you know, we, we don't dare take after these people. We've got to turn around and we've got to sell this on, on a very positive approach. We've got to tell them how good our milk hauler is. We've got to tell them how good our organization is and what the benefits of it are. Well, we, ended, we had a a team that went to Vermont, and Ed mentioned this yesterday, that we were very successful. I guess Devon even mentioned it. We found a sleeper out there, he said. Well, it wasn't quite a sleeper. We put together a team of people from across the country, the staff people went out there for a two-week vacation. <laughs> Ed told us that if we went out there and could enroll 100 new members, that he would consider it a success and would buy dinner for the home office staff. We ended up with over 300 new members. And he still hasn't bought that dinner. <laughs> While we were out there, that uh, team of people, of staff people, got nicknamed the SWAT team. Now, that don't mean they had boots on and carried a rifle or a billy club or anything like that. It just meant that they had bags and would travel. And they did. 
And they're still doing it. And we're still having success in the areas we go into. But we found out a few other things. That before we can go into an area, there has to be certain things that have to be followed. Before we went to Vermont, Ted McCarty had been out there with a series of meetings and had large groups of people into those meetings just to hear about the new National Farmers Organization. Now, we think that the easiest way to get everything done is get everybody together in a big meeting and get them all enrolled right there, right? wrong you ain't going to do it that way you can't do it that way the next best thing is go out with house meetings get five or six of the neighbors all together right there in the house and get them all enrolled right that works pretty good if you can get them all together but if one rotten apple can spoil the whole barrel pertinent takes going right down that road to get it done now I said that there's a few things that have to be done before a team can go out and really be successful. You've got to have the preparation. We had it in Vermont. Ted had held the meetings all through the area so that the, the, the idea was out there. They knew that the new National Farmers Organization was in the area, that we had an active program. We met with the members in the area about a week and a half prior to the team going out there. At that meeting with the leaders in the area, the county leaders, there were things that we asked that they have done. Number one, that they go home and grease the front end on their car just prior to us coming out there. We wanted to make sure that when they went and, and drove us around the country, that it would turn into each and every driveway very freely. Because too often, it, it, there's some out there that just seem we can't get that turned into. I'll bet each one of you have got a neighbor someplace out there that there's no sense in going to see Dick today because he won't join anyhow. You've all got somebody like that. Now, we as staff people, we don't want to know that. You may know it, but we don't want to. And we'll find out when we go up there and knock on the door whether you're right or wrong, but we don't want to know it beforehand. Let us find it out. So we told them, make sure you've got a list of people of at least 15 names each day, each day because our staff people have to make at least six eyeball contacts to get anything done. And to make six eyeball contacts, you've got to have a list of at least 15 people because there's going to be a lot of them that aren't home. There's going to be some others that are too busy to talk. And we've got to be able to see at least six people a day. We also warned them very definitely, very clearly, that the man, there was only one head man there, and that was that staff person. They were to introduce him, or if they didn't want to even do that, they could drive him into the driveway and sit in the car. But there was only one head man there, and that was that staff person and he was to do the talking. And when he made a closing question, absolutely everybody shut up. You remember that from those old staff meetings? Training sessions? And it works. The people in Vermont did very well. The staff was trained and we had great results. I can remember we had some new people on the, on the team there that hadn't been with the organization too long. And I can remember that we'd come in at nights and we'd sit there and we'd talk over the problems that we'd had during the day. What was it that we had done wrong or how did we say something right? Just what was it that went good or what went bad? And we'd get together every night and we'd talk about this. And I can remember one individual that I had to work on for two or three days because he wasn't getting anything accomplished. And I'd keep asking him, are you closing? Are you asking them to join? Yeah, yeah, he was. Well, tell me how you did it. And I'd find out that he really wasn't asking them. So finally one day he'd come in and he says, you know, I finally did it. I asked a guy to enroll and I got him. But he says, I closed, and he says, I shut up. 
And he says, I sat there and the sweat just run down my back. But he became a very successful salesperson out in that area. I can remember another individual out there that come in one night and he says, you know, I was out to this fella's house and I started to make my presentation and he said yes. He says, I wasn't ready. I says, wait just a minute, I'm not through here yet. He says, I went right on the guy said yes. But I still wasn't ready to close, so I just kept right on going. I hadn't told him all of it yet. The third time the guy said yes, he, he said, well, boy, I better start filling this out. Isn't that right, Marvin? <laughs> we do have a staff that's very well trained. We're very proud of them. We're proud of the fact that we've got a 20% increase over a year ago. We're going to have a more... SWAT teams out in the area that's going to be able to go to this area or that area on a continuing basis. We're going to hire people that will have their bags packed and will be able to travel. They will be successful and we next year can come back and we'll talk not just about 20%, we'll talk about more than that. You people come to a convention each year and a lot of you come each year and I don't believe you come here just for a vacation, do you? You come here to find out what results you've had and how you can get more results, right? Because we all like results, don't we? Will you do a few things to help us get more results? We've got our staff trained where they're not out there with a BB gun, they're armed with a rifle. In fact, at times I think they're getting a little too good and a little too cocky. But they are armed with that rifle now, and they're out ready to go. But they themselves can only do so much. Before a team can go into any area and get anything accomplished, that area has to be ready. That means that you people have to be out there laying some groundwork. You've got to be out there talking to your neighbors, and telling them, I'm proud of the new National Farmers Organization. I'm proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Let them know that you're on that milk truck, that you're shipping your hogs or your cattle or your grain. Let them know that you're satisfied. And then when that team comes in, they'll be three times more effective than if no one had been out there prior to it. We've put together a brochure that was handed out to you when you came in. This particular brochure was designed to use out in the country. It has listed in here many of the benefits of the new National Farmers Organization. Our staff is trained to go out and use this brochure. They can go through it make a complete presentation by using this one pamphlet and leave it in the hands of that person when they leave. If you people will help us, next year we aren't going to be talking about a 20% increase. It could be 30 or 40. You know, I joined this organization to get cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Is that the reason you joined? I don't believe when any of us enrolled that we thought it would be easy. I doubt if any of us really expected it to come overnight. Many of us are getting up in years and we're getting old and we're getting tired. But you know, we can look out here and we can see some of the young people that are coming on that are going to help take over. Even though we're getting old and we're getting tired, we can still go out and do our part. We don't want you to necessarily go out and be able to make a presentation and have all the nail downs, be able to 
answer the objection formula and use that correctly. But we do expect you to go out there and be proud of your organization and let it be known that you're a member, that the organization is active, it's there in the area, it's available, that the milk truck goes past that neighbor's farm. When this happens, with the staff of people we've got, with the organization we've got today, it's not going to take us too much longer to get this job done. Take these brochures out, read them, go over them, use the benefits. Everybody out there wants benefits to him. And we have them to offer. If you'll go out and use it, next year when we come back, it'll be a completely different story. Thank you. This is the first time that I've ever had to defend myself against the staff in a public meeting, but I'm going to do it, and he knows it. That dinner is going to be served the 20th of December. <laughs> they may not get what they wanted, but they're going to get fed. <laughs> In these meetings, we can see, and we hope you can see, the benefits for farmers to be a member of this organization and put the production through it. Without that, of course, there's very little we can do, as you well know. So I want to close with just this thought. I know that what Walt Hackney said yesterday, some are getting tired. I know that Devon Woodland said, mistakes are made, but those who don't do anything haven't really, or don't make mistakes, haven't really done much. And I attended the National Bargaining Conference in New Orleans on January 11th, this past year. As far as I know, it was Orrin Lee Staley who always attended that meeting. And he always came back and said, Ed, there's nobody bargaining for farmers. I don't know if you can believe that. I never had the impact on me till I was there to see what they're doing and what they're talking about and I can truthfully say there's no bargaining for American agriculture today other than what you see at conventions like this and members of your organization. If there had been, we wouldn't be facing a decision that we've got to make now because it's the old system or the new one that NFO has put together. And I'm proud of what Al has been able to do with that procurement system, and all of us can be proud of that 20% growth this past year. We hope you're rejuvenated, some, to understand that we are growing. We have been affecting the markets, but the opposition has not keeled over by any means, because in January of this year in Vermont, You've heard the name Howard Hort used a few times, who was the chief economist for USDA. And I'll take a paragraph from a speech that he gave, and this will be the policy with the farm bill coming up, with the cheap food policy they have. And he said, we have been working closely with producer groups in recent weeks to find out if they share our view of the situation and the outlook. He's speaking of dairy. They generally agree with our numbers and they tend to share our concern. To be blunt, the program is in trouble. It is providing producers with strong economic signals to increase production at a time when milk and milk products are in surplus supply. It is inflexibly increasing support levels and consumers' costs at a time when retail prices are already high and food price inflation is a matter of serious national concern. And it is providing producers increases in returns not justified by your costs. That's what you're facing. Now let's take a look at how they reward people like that. In the Sunday Register, October 
first. It's entitled Bonus Babies. The superstars of the federal bureaucracy lined up the other day at a White House ceremony to get $20,000 bonuses for exceptional job performance. One of the 49 recipients was Howard Hjort for telling the American people or the American farmer that you're getting too much. They reward him. Now that you're facing. Or the NFO program that will give us a choice. Either they tell us what we're going to get or we tell them what we're going to charge. I go for the latter. Thank you very much. The third meeting, we will stay, answer questions, listen to suggestions, anything you people may have to offer. Thanks a lot for coming.